Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless, God bless, God bless. God bless you. To, <clears throat> this is the night that God has given us. <laughs> and let us understand the victory is in Jesus. Amen. My uh, message today comes from Roman chapter 1, verse 1. It's actually two parts of this. I'll start today and next week I'll finish it up. The credentials of Paul the Apostle, part one. Church, tonight we embark on a study of what is perhaps the greatest book of the New Testament. I know that a big uh, statement, however, Romans is without question the greatest theological work of Apostle Paul. This book, church, has been called the Constitution of Christianity, the Christian Manifesto, and the, re and the Cathedral of the Christian Faith. Without a doubt, this book church has been responsible for more change in the church than any other. Church, in this book, it was this book church that in September of 386 AD touched the heart of a North African native and who was a professor in the city of Milan, Italy. As Augustine sat weeping in the garden of a friend while contemplating the weakness of his life, he heard a child sing these words from uh, Latin means uh, take up and read. Take up and read. Besides of Augustine was an open stroll of the book of Romans. He picked it up, church, and read the first verse that caught his eyes. They were Roman 13, chapter 13, verse 13 to 14. Church, these verses brought about the conversion of Augustine and he became, in the mind of many, one of the greatest theologians and leaders in the history of the church. 1,000 years later, a Roman Catholic monk by the name of Augustinian ordered a uh, order name other uh, order name other name Martin Luther was a professor at the University of Wittenberg in Germany was teaching his students the book of Romans uh, of Romans as Romans as he studied the text church the heart his heart was arrested by the theme of justification by faith. The Holy Scripture used these verses to bring Luther to Christ and the Reformation to the world. Church, a hundred years later, an ordained minister in the Church of England named John Wesley was repairing to take the gospel to America as a missionary. However, even though Wesley was a preacher and was going to the cross, going to cross the Atlantic Ocean as a missionary, he was confused about the gospel and was seeking a general conversion experience of his own. Then, one Wednesday evening church, he attended a Bible study in London. While there he heard some of Luther's comments on Romans being read and this brought about the conversion to Christ. 
his conversion to Christ. Then John, along with his brother Charles, would be the tools God would use to bring a great res or wisely re revival to the world. Church, over the next several months, as the Lord leads, I intend to preach through, through this great book verse by verse. As I do, I will find that a great many questions about God and what he has given us in Jesus will be answered. This church is a book that is impossible to exalt. It is, uh, it will captivate the most brilliant of the theological minds and, br and will bring the humblest of God's servants to tears. Romans was written by Paul the Apostle between 56 and 58 ED AD from the city of Corinthian while Paul was on his third missionary journey. The Bible tells us that after Paul was saved, he spent three years in Arabia. During this time, he studied the Old Testament writings and how they spoke of Jesus. He, when he returned to Jerusalem church, he came with this great eclipse burning in his heart. Let's join Paul tonight in these verses, in these first seven verses as he discussed church his credentials with members of the church of Rome church as Paul discussed himself and his ministry he also shared some light on our mission as we go through life. Church, this is the longest introduction to any of the New Testament eclipse. It is also the richest in theological content. Let's spend a few minutes, church, here as we consider the credentials of the Apostle Paul, the fact about the messenger, his condition. Church, as Paul began his comments to the Roman Christians, he doesn't begin boasting of his office. No, church. He begins by proclaiming himself to be a servant. The word means a bond slave. This calls to mind the law of the bond slave from the Old Testament according to this law. A slave could refuse his freedom and could choose to remain with his master forever. Instead of exalting, uh, exalting himself before the Romans, Paul chose to humble himself. Church, this was the secret of Paul's greatness. Paul knew that like a slave, he had no personal rights. His life was dictated to him by the master. He was totally sold out to the will of God, church. There's no doubt that this is why the Lord used Paul so greatly. Church, this lesson that the modern Christians need to learn, we have so many who feel that they are in control of their lives and that they have the right to do as they please and make as their own decisions. Make their own decisions, church. We need to remember that when we were saved by Jesus Christ, he became his, uh, we became his bond servants. He brought us and now he owns us completely. Church, this message of slavery was commonplace to Paul's readers. However, we don't understand it so well, therefore I would like to take a moment to share a few facts about slaves and slavery with you this evening. 
as I do, I want you to, I want to, uh, <clears throat> I want you to let the Lord speak to your heart about your relationship with Jesus and about your own level of, of surrender to him. The slave was totally owned by the master in spiritual sense. Jesus was, Jesus saw the wretched conditions we were in. He brought us unto himself. He made us his, own, his uh, possession. The slave exists for his master. He had no other reason to exist. He had no right of his own. The only rights he had were those of the master. Church, the slave existed to serve his master. He had no other purpose in his life but to do what the master wanted him to do. He was to be at the master's disposal any hour of the day or night. This is how Paul felt, church. Does that describe your heart this evening? Church, our lives should be lived for the glory of the Lord. We are to do his will totally and without question. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. Even the slave will belong exclusively to his master. He was allowed no will or no admission outside of which his master allowed him to have church. In other words, church, there was to be a total surrender of every part of the slaves, of the slave being to the will of the master. Church, listen to me. Note this, that when Paul mentions his master, that it is none other than the Lord Jesus. A slave lives. Whether it was good or evil depends upon the character of his master. In the case of the believer, our master is Jesus. Therefore, instead of cringing and cowing in fear before this one, we call Lord. We are servants who have been elevated to the status of priests and kings. Church, our position of honor before the Lord. We are perhaps the only slaves in history who are allowed to sit with their master in his throne. His calling. Not only was Paul a slave to a new master church, he was also an apostle. This word means an ambassador. This word literally means a set one. He was a person set out into another country as a representative of heaven. Ambassadors usually carry with them the authority of the country and the king which sent them. Paul was no ex exception. He was a representative of King Jesus and he operated under his divine authority. Church, when Paul spoke, he spoke for the Lord. When he acted, he acted as a representative of the throne of heaven. His authority was very, his authority was the very authority of God. God himself. Church, what does this mean for us? It is worthy of note that Paul was what he was by the will of God. Notice this church that he had been called. Paul did not just decide to go into the, hit the ministry, no. Nor did his friends and family persuade him that it was 
what he should do. He was placed in the ministry by the sovereign will of Almighty God. Paul became what he did by the grace of God and was operating in his life. Just as God picked and placed Paul, he also does the same for you and me. He placed us, church, in his kingdom work when and where it pleases him. Church, if he could take his worst enemy and make him his greatest messenger. Do you hear me? I said he uh, could take his worst enemy and make him his great messenger. Then God can and will use your life for his glory if you will yield to him. Never let the devil, Satan, the low life, or any other person tell you that God cannot and will not use your life for his glory. He saved you by his grace. And he wants to use you to bring others into him, unto him. He has a place of service for you. And he will place you there if you will yield to him. Church, while we do not hold the office of apostle, we are the ambassadors of heaven. God has commissioned us to be his, his spokespersons to a lost and dying world. In fact, the Bible plainly tell us that we are the very words of God written to speak to the people of the world. When the world sees you and me, let's, let ever, let them, let uh, them see a people who are sold out and committed to the will of God. That's our gravy train, church. In the world, church, yeah, they need to see people who are living like they are indeed the representatives of heaven. Like salt in a bland world, we should flavor our lives with the glory of God and create a thirst in, in others for the things of God. His commission, church. Paul next statement tell us that he had been separated unto the gospel of God. There are some great blessings contained in this little phrase. Separated. This word, church, has the idea of being set apart. Paul is telling us that his life has been set apart for the glory of God and for the Lord Jesus Christ. This literally means that nothing else mattered to Paul but the things that matter to God. Church, Paul are concerned with being separated from the world. They will tell you that you have to stop doing this thing or the other thing to be perfectly separated. Their whole life revolves around what they can and cannot do. I personally believe, church, that the people like this are missing the boat. Our job is not to separate from the world, church. It is to separate unto Christ. If we are separated unto Christ, right, then we are automatically separated from the world. I cannot be in evil and want to be separated unto another place without first becoming separated from. Does that mean sense? Does that make any sense, church? If I am living in one area, then it is impossible for me to dwell in another. So if I really want to be separated from the world 
I and I think that is what God wants, then the secret lies in totally devouring, uh, devoting my life to the to the Lord Jesus Christ. If I live to please Him, I will have no trouble with the world. Church, the world translate, laid it, separated. It's the same word from which we get our word horizon. The sense of this word is literally off horizon. It tells us that Paul's horizon had changed before he has headed toward a religious hell living a life of legalism and rebellion against Christ now his life has been changed and he is headed toward a new horizon his is, is radically a radically different life so it is with every child of God who is in the world today we have been change forever. We are headed toward a new horizon before our destiny was an eternity in hell. Now we have been saved and are headed to heaven to be with the Lord forever. Before our lives, uh, before our lives were filled with sin and rebellion, now we have been called out as ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven the very representatives of God in the world today. Paul then tells us that he has been separated to the gospel of God. His commission is that of carrying the good news of Jesus to a world uh, uh, trapped in sin and uh, lostness. This gospel, church, is a special message. Notice It is the gospel of God, church. This message did not originate in the mind of man. No, it came from the heart of God. The plan, uh, uh, the plan that uh, would culminate with Jesus dying on the cross, uh, and then raising from the dead was and is God's plan. It was devised long before man ever stood on the earth. Had man developed the plan of salvation, it surely would have included works and religious rituals. People love that sort of thing, church. Man would have fixed it so that he got a little of the credit. God, on the other hand, fixed it so that lost sinners could, could come to him freely in faith and receive eternal salvation by the grace of God. Church, it is God's, uh, it is a gospel born in the heart of God. Why would God want us, want to go to such a great limb to save the world and get his message to the world? The answer is that God is love. And that he does not want to see a single sinner die without him. His love is so great, church, that it will stop at nothing to get the message out. He will even use people like you and me. Just consider for a moment, church, these people that God calls into the ministry. This kind of love illustrated by an old young uh, uh, story from England, from France. It seemed that there was a young Frenchman who was loved, who was loved very deeply by his mother. However, when this young man reached adulthood, he, like all young men, he fell in love with a very wicked young woman who was able to gain his total devotion. When the young man's mother tried to turn her son away from this wicked and ungodly relationship, the young woman became extremely angry. She told her lover 
that if he really loved her, he would prove it by going to his mother's home, killing her, and returning with her heart to prove that he had done the deed. This young man resisted. That was his mother, his mama, church. But his girlfriend continued to pressure him until one night, in a drunken state, he went to his mom's home, killed her, and cut out her heart. As he returned to his girlfriend's home, as he entered the door, he stumbled and fell to the floor. When he did, the heart is said to have cried out, Son, are you hurt? Church, isn't that how, how things are between God and, and man? He created us, he loves us, and yet man raises up in rebellion against God ultimately. Church, participating in, the, in God's death at Calvary, even with all this against us, God still loves our hurt condition and reaches out to make things right between us and himself. When we have done our... When, church, we have done our best to keep the Lord out of our lives, He still reminds us, church, of His love and calls us to come unto Him. His gospel certainly is the good news. Church, it isn't only the gospel that will save the lost. God only knows of one plan that will save the lost soul. It is the only gospel that will save the lost. We are the messengers of this great gospel in this present day. Just as Paul was separated church in the first century to carry the gospel to the lost then, we are called to do the same in this day. The message is just as precious and the need just as great. Our duty, church, is to submit to the Lord's will for our lives and be his ambassadors in the world. How are we, huh? How are we doing in getting the gospel out? In my conclusion, as I bring this first message from Romans to the close. We haven't covered much territory from the standpoint of birth cover. However, I think you will agree with me that the things that have been said this evening are amuse, eternal, and practical value. Paul considered himself to be a slave to Jesus an ambassador of God and a proclaimer of the good news of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, did you know that God holds the same expectation for you and me? His will is that we go forth into the world with his message as his representatives in his name and power and that we tell his good news to those who are perishing. When we lay ourselves alongside the great apostle, how do we measure up, church? Is there more we can do? Are we surrounded to the level we should be? Are we consumed with a burden for the lost and with the need, church, to get out the gospel? If the Lord has dealt with your heart through this message, church, I invite you to come to the altar and do what the Lord would have you to do. In Jesus' name, church, let this message, if this message was a blessing to you, find yourself a Bible-based church and become a part of the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.
dear beloved, as we gather in this sacred moment, let us reflect on the profound message found in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, where the Apostle Paul introduced himself self, as a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This simple yet powerful declaration invites us to embrace our own identity in Christ and to recognize our calling in the world. As we depart from this gathering, may we remember that like Paul, we are called to be servants of Christ. Let us embrace our identity as beloved children of God, chosen and equipped to share his love and grace. In every interaction, may we strive to exemplify the humanity and dedication of the servant, reflecting the character of Christ in our words and deeds. May our lives be testament, testaments to the transformative power of the gospel, drawing others to the light of his truth. Paul, calling as an apostle, serves as a reminder that each of us has a unique role in the body of Christ. As we, as we go forth, let us seek to understand our individual calling, whether in our families, workplace, or communities. May, may we be bold in sharing the hope of the gospel, just as Paul was bold in his mission. Let us, church, pray for our courage to step out of our comfort zone to be ambassadors of reconciliation, bringing the message of, of salvation to those around us. In the beginning, God created the earth. May God be with us. In Jesus' name, Jesus, our chief architect of victory. In his name, amen.